Church of Truth, good morning. If our ushering team can help, those that are in the lobby can begin to come in. Let's stand to our feet. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this day that you have made. We thank you so much, Lord, for your holy presence in this place. We thank you so much. The word of God says that with boldness we can enter the most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the power of your blood today, that it has not lost power for us, those who have been washed by it, those who have come, Lord, to your, into your presence. The blood today has power, God, for us to enter into your holy presence, and we thank you so much for washing our body, for washing our conscience, for cleansing us, Lord. We thank you so much, Lord, that we can stand in your presence with boldness because of the power of the blood of Jesus. We thank you that it has cleansed us, made us white as snow. And today, Lord, we are able to lift our hands to you. The word of God says that when we lift our hands unto, the God, unto God, we are lifting holy hands. Holy hands because they've been cleansed with holy blood. And we thank you, Lord, so much that we can stand today in your presence lifting holy hands and opening up our mouth. God, right now I thank you for your Holy Spirit in this place, leading us in to the presence of God, leading us in to worship and to praise. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We bless your holy name in this place. Come on, I want you to lift your hands right now. Lift your hands, even if you feel uncomfortable, even if you've had a hard week, I want you to lift your hands and begin to thank God for the blood that has cleansed you. Begin to thank God for the cross that set you free. In Jesus' mighty name, we thank you, Lord. Your church this morning gives you what you are worthy of. Thanksgiving and praise and honor and worship. And we thank you, Lord, today for what you have done. We thank you for what you've accomplished in our life. And we bless your holy name in this place. We bless your holy name in this place.
Give Him glory. Give Him glory. Lord, we thank You. We thank You, Lord. We worship Your name. Receive Your glory. Receive Your praise. Receive Your worship. We thank You for Your presence. We thank You for the power, Lord, of the resurrection. We thank You, Lord, that in death there is life. We thank You that in Your blood, Lord, there is healing. We thank You there is restoration. We thank You, Lord, for all that You bring, God. And we glorify Your name. We glorify your name. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the gift. We thank you for his presence now. And we glorify your mighty name. We thank you for what you've prepared, Lord. We thank you for what you are doing in this very moment, Lord. We thank you for the hearts that you are speaking to. We thank you that in worship, Lord, the circumstances we've come with, you break them away, Lord. We thank you that in worship, Lord, you loosen, Lord. You break away, God. You remove the things that burden us. We thank you and we glorify your name. Receive your praise, receive your worship, and the mighty, mighty, mighty praise, Lord, that we bring to you. And the church glorifies him and says together, amen, 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 amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, worship team, always incredible. Thank you, guys. It's my pleasure to see all of you. You're all up on your feet. I encourage you, get out of your seats, shake some hands, introduce yourself, find a new face, find someone you don't know. Good morning, Church of Truth. Good morning. It's, it's good to see all of you guys. What an incredible way to start a morning. Amen? Amen. Um, just want to welcome any, any, do we have any new guests? Can I welcome any new guests? Do we have any guests in the building? Raise your hand. Can you guys, can you guys stand up, please? Can we welcome them? Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're happy to have you guys in our home. If you're seated around this family here, please meet, make sure you come by, introduce yourself, welcome them into our home, treat them to a coffee. Um, I also want to introduce everyone that's watching us on any form of social media, wherever you are today. We believe, and I know that God has something prepared for you. So open your heart up, share whatever platform you are to your friends, to your family. Um, my hope is that you receive something today. We've got a couple of announcements. Our first one is that um, next Sunday at 10 a.m., make sure you pin this one into your calendar. This will be a combined service at 10 a.m. Uh, if you get here a little bit early, um, that's okay if you're here for both services. But be here at 10 a.m., uh, be ready for it, and uh, have your kids. And the second announcement is, I know we've all been waiting for this one, our fast begins January 2nd. Come on, a little bit more excitement, right? Our fast begins on the 2nd. You know, take, take the fast on, uh, on, on whatever you're most comfortable with, right? If you can fast from food, fast from food. If you did three days last year, do five days. If you did, did 10 days, push for 15 days. If you maybe have some kind of a, a, a legal, or I'm sorry, illegal, um, geez, uh, maybe you have some, uh, some health issues where you can't step into maybe a, a lengthy time fast from, you know, we, our kids fast from, from screen time during the time that we fast, find something within your family that works for you. And, you know, as we're coming up, I know it's difficult to step into it because it's the holiday season, but I personally like to pull back on certain things. I'm down to you know, two cups of coffee as opposed to you know, the regular day, so start to reduce things that, so you're not going into it cold turkey, otherwise it might be a little bit tough for you. Um, I also want to pass on greetings from um, the team that we served with in Lebanon, for those of us, for our interns that got a chance to get out there, uh, spoke with him yesterday, Slavic is thankful for all your prayers, um, they're in Lebanon, they left uh, when the war tensions uh, rose, took his family home 
came back. They're back in the field. They're back serving, and he just wants to he just wants to thank all of you guys that have been supporting him, praying for prayers, and sending prayers and sending funds, um, helping out in whatever way you could. They're really grateful, and they just want to pass that on to you guys. So, let's give. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about giving. So. You know, it's not a very popular opinion because we're born into a world of fleshly desires. But uh, when it comes to giving, when you observe the act of sacrifice, the, sac- the act of sacrifice is actually given to us as a key for growth. I know it's a tough one, but think about it. Uh, sacrificing or taking away from yourself is a formula for increase. Sacrificing is actually a formula for increase. See, God, God is a God of order, um, and for us to have any form of stability, for us to have any form of growth uh, or pursuit in our spiritual walk with him, our pursuit in maybe a personal sphere, our pursuit in a business area, uh, for any growth to happen, sacrifices must take place, especially in the kingdom of God especially in the kingdom of God, increases through sacrifice. If this is a concept, if this is a biblical concept that the world applies in, in, in it, let's just see, even use the business world, then imagine what, can, what it does in the spiritual realm. When we give, when we sacrifice. Abraham was tested, becomes the father of faith. Jesus sacrifices food for 40 days in preparation to face the devil, and he knew that shutting down his flesh doesn't weaken us but it strengthens us. So if going into 2024, you have a desire for, for a heart of generosity, you have a desire for a heart of love, and that's something that you want to strengthen within yourself, this is something I want to challenge you guys to do. Um, you know, if you intend to grow, um, sacrifice must be made in, in order for that to grow. Something has to break in order to make room. Proverbs 11.25 says, The generous souls will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. So the Lord wants to bless you, but throughout that time, the goodness and the molding of your heart that has to take place is what he is after. He, 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 when we give, our heart is softened, our heart is humbled, the generosity is ensured, the love is ensured, and that's where it grows. So if you, if you, right where you are, I encourage you, so right where you are. Right, if you're waiting on a, on, a, a, on a big thing to come in, you're waiting on a dollar amount to come in before you start to give, if you can't give in the big, or if you can't give in the little, you're going to have a hard time giving in the big. So that's what I encourage you. Right where you are, bloom right there, sow right there, let those seeds fall and let God, does what God, uh, let God do what he does. Amen? Let's give ushers, if you guys can help with the buckets, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you so much for the word you've prepared, God. We thank you for our provisions. We thank you for what we've brought, Lord. And I pray, God, that you speak to those people, Lord, that want to challenge themselves in the area, that you help them see that, their Lord, if they stretch themselves out, how much more you can provide, Lord. That if they bring it to you with full faith, Lord, knowing that you can provide that you do. We thank you for what you're going to do in this service, Lord. We thank you for the word. We bless it in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. If we can, please welcome up. My good friend, Alex. Worthy is the lamb. How's everyone doing? Good morning. Um, Speaking of lambs, actually, I uh, usually tell my three-year-old, sorry, whoever's on, I think I'm hearing an echo. It's kind of distracting. Um, Okay. I uh, I usually tell my three-year-old stories every night or almost every night before he goes to bed, and he prefers, a, you know, many, and then we negotiate a little bit in terms of how many stories and about what. Usually there's stories about horses, and then towards the top of his list, every time, are usually stories about sheep. And these sheep, they live in a barn, and they have adventures on the daily that they explore things, and they learn things, and all sorts of stuff happens. And at first, I started kind of making these stories up as I went, and I tried to make them educational in some way. Uh, but then I realized, you know, I was like, oh, well, this is, this is nice. Like, it's a, you know, it's a, a creative outlet or something. And then, you know, I'm bragging to my wife. I'm like, babe, I'm on season three. Like, these horses are really evolving in their character. But now it's getting kind of hard. Like, I'm trying to make stuff up as I go. And there's only so many things that sheep can realistically do, right? And so I'm coming up with things out of thin air, and it's, it's getting hard. 
But I wanted to share a story about sheep with you guys that didn't come out of thin air. This one actually happened. And it happened in 2005 in, I think it was Eastern Turkey. About 1,500 sheep ran off a cliff. And uh, what happened was, according to people who may have seen it, bystanders, the first sheep was like, I'm out, bat, jumps off, and then the rest of them follow. And it sounds kind of weird, but like 450 sheep actually died. Like 26 families lost a lot of, of, of their wealth. And what happens is, you see, like, we had sheep here a few weeks ago, so many of you may remember, but sheep are pretty fluffy, they're soft. And so the first 450 sheep fell, and they kind of caused, like, a mattress. Um, and so that's actually how the rest of the 1,500 sheep managed to survive. Like, they landed on these 450 sheep. Just imagine how big of a deal this is, though. I mean, there's people that, you know, have lost a lot. Uh, and so the end. There's a story I won't tell my three-year-old. But sometimes sheep wander, right? And without their shepherd, they can do things like this, and it's not that uncommon. Um, for a shepherd, especially even now, but especially in ancient times, they had something called a rod and something called a staff. A staff is like that long thing that, you know, curves at the end. And so when sheep wander, it's not a matter of if, it's when. They get very curious. Uh, they can actually take that curve and they can kind of grab it around the sheep's neck and redirect them a little bit. It may be a little uncomfortable for the sheep, but they get on the right track. The rod was actually to fight off enemies, and those enemies usually come in the form of wolves. Sheep are kind of bad at protecting themselves. If you haven't noticed, they don't really have anything to protect themselves with, and so they rely on their shepherd. And so the shepherd would fight off wolves. Sometimes he'd fight off other things. Like in the Old Testament, David was like fighting off, I think he said bears, right? Like there's all sorts of stuff that shepherds would have to fight off in order to protect the sheep. And so now that I got you guys thinking about sheep, we're going to go to John 10. And before we go to John 10, I wanted to summarize where we are. Because see, the Bible's uh, divisions of chapters and verses came later so that we could easily find what we're trying to look for. But in the original, it goes from 9 to 10. And what happens is in chapter 9, Jesus heals a blind man. And many of you may know this story. It's, it's the, the interesting part where he, you know, spits in some, uh, some dirt, makes it mud, basically rubs this clay mud stuff on the guy's eyes and says, okay, now go wash yourself. The guy washes himself and then realizes he got healed. What happens after that, though, is the Pharisees start to question him. And they pretty much interrogate him. They question him. They question his parents. And then they question him again, and, and they're kind of not very nice to him, and they, they're, they're a little prideful, and, and they kick him out. After they kick him out, though, Jesus finds this man, and uh, the man ends up believing in Jesus and worshiping him. And so then Jesus is talking about spiritual blindness, and that's when the Pharisees overhear him, and they start questioning him. And that's where we are now in, um, in John 10, but... One couple more things. In John 10, Jesus is going to talk about hired hands. A hired hand is something like, if, if you are a very wealthy person uh, in those times and you have a lot of sheep, you're probably not tending them yourself. You're hiring a shepherd to actually take care of your sheep. And these shepherds would have responsibilities. And if they fail to defend their sheep against something, they could get fired. They could, you know, there's all sorts of things that happen, but they're hired hands. They're not their sheep. They're hired to take care of them. And there's so much going on in John 10. There's I am statements being made. You can look that up later. And then there's, uh, there's something that happens here uh, that is in Ezekiel. I, I think Jesus is comparing himself as the good shepherd with the chapter of Ezekiel 34, which is basically a condemnation. If you read the whole chapter, it's basically a condemnation from God to the bad shepherds of Israel. The reason they're bad shepherds is because they don't care about the sheep. They only care about themselves. And so the whole chapter is basically a condemnation and then almost a prophetic uh, side of it um, that, that comes out in there as well. And I think Jesus is fulfilling that prophecy among many as well. And so with that in our minds, before we read, I want us to pay very close attention to the relationship that, that the shepherd has with the sheep in this chapter. So there's going to be a bit of reading. So there's going to be the most reading I'm going to do all morning. You ready? Okay. Uh, so John 10. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, 
and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all, when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. We're going to skip down to verse 27. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. In this analogy of the good shepherd and the sheep, you have a good shepherd that actually lays down his life for the sheep. You have sheep that are following him. He calls them by name. There's, there's an intimacy here. He loves them. He cares for them. Unlike a hired hand that runs away in the first sign of trouble, this shepherd is actually ready to die for his sheep because they are his. And here's the promise. No one will snatch his sheep out of his hand. Now, I don't know what you guys were doing on your Thursday afternoon, but I went into the rabbit hole of, of the fascinating world of shepherding. And uh, it's actually really interesting. So sh sheep are really bad at leading themselves, like really bad. Uh, without some barrier, someone leading them, something going on, they will go off of cliffs and stuff. Like they, they get themselves into trouble all the time. And that's simply what sheep do. But here's the thing, don't get me wrong, they're actually, they're actually not that dumb when it comes to certain things. So there was a study done, um, it was out of the Institute of Cambridge in England, and the study was done, I know someone's studying this, the memory recollection of sheep. And so what they discovered is sheep can actually recognize up to 50 other sheep faces, 50. And they actually know the, the face of their shepherd. I think they even used pictures and the sheep would still recognize the sheep and the shepherd that they know. It's really not that uncommon for sheep to recognize their shepherd's voice, um, their, their shepherd's face. And for the shepherds, if it's, if it's a committed full-time shepherd, for the shepherd to be able to even differentiate between his sheep and someone else's sheep. It's kind of, it's kind of interesting. But with, without a shepherd, domesticated sheep are like... They're, they're not really great at surviving. Like, they'll eat all the grass in a pasture and then not realize that there's, they should go find another pasture and become malnourished. Um, if their fur gets, either it's fluffy, so if their fur gets really wet, they can drown in something that's just over a pool of water. Like, they get stuck in things. They get, they get curious and they fall off of things. They can trample each other to death sometimes. Like, and that's not even including all the wolves that are out there trying to get them as well. This is how badly they need direction. They need a shepherd. And... We actually have a lot in common with sheep, don't we? When we think about it. Some people don't like being called a sheep. It's kind of like an insult. It's like it means that you, you know, you're, you're influenced easily. You believe things and you just kind of aren't making your own way, whatever that means. Uh, but aren't we all influenced by something? Aren't we all following something, whether we want to admit it or not? I mean, the sheep around us, the herd that we're following, is really just the culture in which we're immersed in. Our decision-making, our... Ideas, our political opinions, the way that we dress, the way that we behave, 
A lot of it is influenced by the culture in which we live. Even beyond just what we're able to observe ourselves, there's more influences than we realize, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, there's a French psychologist that I looked up, uh, Gustave Le Bon. He said this. It's very interesting. The greater part of our daily actions are the result of hidden motives which escape our observation. So the greater part of our daily actions is a result of hidden motives that escape our observation. These are motives that we don't even recognize, but our daily actions stem from those motives. And so your motive, so your actions, they have motives behind them. And if you pay attention to what those motives are, they can reveal a lot about who your shepherd is. Something is influencing you. So the question is, who or what am I led by? If I examine my motives, am I primarily chasing money or influence or my five-year plan is always on my mind or is it the next vacation? Don't get me wrong. All these things are really good. Like, go get your raise, you know, establish your five-year plan, take care of your kids, go to Paris, Cancun, whatever your dream is. The point is, as long as you're still attentive to the voice of the Good Shepherd. I'm not saying these things are bad, but... Like, if you're going to work, and you're going to work because you want to make money, it's not like, oh my goodness, this is your shepherd. I'm saying, like, if, if the money that you are making is the end goal, and that's all you want, and you're thinking about that as you work, you're thinking about that when it comes to generosity, you're thinking about that when it comes to how you treat other people, then that's an interesting motive that should be looked into. But if we're following the voice of the good shepherd, then the other motives fall into line. And so, like the bad shepherds of Israel that did not care for their sheep in Ezekiel 34, these other shepherds also don't care for your soul. All they're after is what they can get from you, whether it's your time, your money, your relationships, your resources. Just look at the algorithms on Instagram and Facebook. Look at the suggestions on your Netflix account. Like, everything is after something, and you're the attention, you're the commodity. And what happens is they want something from you where the good shepherd is willing to lay down his life for you. So what or who is guiding your life? And if we think we're not influenced, I think we're more influenced than we realize. And with this influence, we can drown out the voice of our shepherd. And we can wander off, just like any sheep. We can get lost, and we can lose our very souls. And the interesting thing is, many of us, from time to time, whether we admit it or not, we long for this soul-level rest, this soul-level refreshment uh, theologian Eugene Peterson wrote this. He said, We stop, whether by choice or through circumstance. It's interesting. Sometimes we stop because we can, and sometimes we stop because we have to. So that we can be alert and attentive and receptive to what God is doing in us and for us, in and for others, on the way, on our journey, right? And this is a, one of my favorite lines he wrote. We wait for our souls to catch up with our bodies. We wait for our souls to catch up with our bodies. If I can ask us all a question this morning to examine our own selves, the question would be, how is your soul doing today? If you are honest with yourself, how is your soul? Because the good shepherd leads us to what our souls truly need. So, the, so then who is my shepherd, right? That should be a question that naturally follows. These other shepherds will burn us out. Whatever, whatever other motives and things that we're serving will burn us out. It'll run away at the first sign of hardship. It'll lose us. It'll never be willing to lay down their life for us. And other shepherds will never refresh our soul. They cost more than we're ever willing to give, including our very souls. So, okay, now that we've established that the sheep do represent us, everyone is technically a sheep in this analogy, right? So what does it mean to follow the good shepherd? Well, I think... The first thing that it means to follow the Good Shepherd is to look at his heart and character as revealed in the scriptures. It would be good for us to understand where the Good Shepherd is guiding us because of things he's already said. And so for those of us who decided to be followers of Jesus, there's a recognition that his voice is actually one that's worth following, right? There's, there's a, a trust, there's a faith in, in the fact that not only is he doing what's best, but he is good in his very nature, in his very character. And so there's a denial of self that takes place, and only when this denial of self takes place is where we can place the leadership and guidance of the Good Shepherd first. And we surrender to his goodness, because a no to us is where a yes to him can actually begin, 
And that's when we experience the ultimate goodness that he has in store for us. Saying no to every other shepherd out there that contradicts him. How do we know what contradicts him? We start by his word. We start by what he said already. And this means I need to stay in tune to his voice. And so there's a tension. Is there a tension between my ways and his in some areas? And what do I choose to trust? Myself or the good shepherd? And sometimes it's hard to trust, right? Especially when something looks so right to us. But I think the reason that it's hard to trust is sometimes we forget that he's good. We need to trust not only that he is, but that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He's a good shepherd. And so Psalm 119, and throughout the Psalms actually, David, we're not going to go there, but David talks about God's word as being a lamp unto his feet, a light to his path, right? He talks about the law of God as like he loves the law of God. Have you guys ever thought about that? Like he, he talks about the law of God like it's the best thing ever for him. Well, there's reasons for this. The law of God is something that gives him guidance. It gives him direction. It gives him a strong footing. He knows what he is to do. It protects him. It guides him. There is a Kenyan marathon world record holder. Um, I figured this guy would be good to talk about discipline. Uh, I'm going to butcher his name, but Iluid Kipchog. Um, he said this, Only the disciplined ones in life are free. If you are undisciplined, you are a slave to your moods and your passions a slave to your moods and your passions. We're all following something. If we're not following the good shepherd, we're following something else. And sometimes that could look like our motives, our moods, our passions, something else. If our motive isn't to follow the shepherd, we will have other motives. And it doesn't matter. This isn't a I play this game or I don't play this game. Everyone is in this. And so if you're not following the good shepherd, you're following something else. And something else does not refresh your soul. And so who is our shepherd? If our shepherd's not Jesus, we're following something else. The differences between everything else and Jesus is that Jesus is actually the good shepherd, whereas all these others are hired hands. That's the difference. And so the good shepherd gives us abundant life. And so I got to ask myself, when I'm engaging in my daily actions, does something else have my attention more than the good shepherd? Am I listening to the voice of another shepherd, or am I trying to be in tune with what the good shepherd is saying? Because Jesus is not a hired hand. If you surrender to him, if he's your shepherd, you said yes to Jesus, then you are, you are his. He's not hired to watch over you. You are his own. He has a personal, intimate connection with you. He cares for your very soul. He leads you to quiet waters. He makes sure that your soul is restored. And he cares for you. So how is your soul feeling today? I want to recap. Let's go through so far. Sheep need a shepherd. They're kind of useless without a shepherd. Uh, we are the sheep in this metaphor, and we all follow something, even if it's not the good shepherd. And so Jesus is the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. He cares for his sheep immensely. He's demonstrated that. He cares for them personally. He leads them. He guides them. And here's the thing. The sheep actually know his voice, and they follow him. And so some of us might be thinking, gosh, what if I don't hear his voice? <laughs> like, what does that mean? What if I'm having a hard time understanding and discerning what his voice is? Am I not a good sheep? Am I not holy enough? Do I not fast and pray enough? Like, what, what's going on here? Or even scarier, what if I'm not his sheep? Like some of the people were in John 10, the passage we read earlier. Well, a few thoughts of this. Sheep need to stay with other sheep. So if you feel a bit lost about which direction to go, and you're in the fold of Jesus, you look to other sheep, and as you come closer to other sheep, you come closer to the shepherd. And so, we're, this is biblical, like, we're, we're, we're commanded not to forsake our assemblies, right? We're, the Christianity cannot be done individually. If someone's doing Christianity individually, they are rejecting the good shepherd and what he and his disciples taught. It's just as simple as that. Christianity is meant to be done in community. It's meant to be done under the lordship of Christ and in the community which he established and paid for by his own blood. And so, it is never meant to be done Separately. So if you're seeking the voice of the shepherd and you're isolated, you're in danger. You've probably already wandered off. That's one. The other thing is, even if you're in the fold, sometimes we're prone to wander. And if you've wandered off, again, he is the good shepherd. He will come find you. Read Matthew 8, 12. He will come find you. But by the time he finds you, sometimes you may have already fallen off a few cliffs. <laughs> you may have already have some bru bruises and you may have broken some legs and Maybe there's some wolf bite marks on you. But here's the thing, you're still his. And he will work with you. He'll heal you. He'll restore you. He'll guide you. And he'll refresh your soul. 
Another reason could be that we don't dive into the scriptures um, to, get to, to get to the heart of God's decision. And so what if he's already said something and we're seeking a prophetic word? And what if he's already told me <laughs> how I should act? What action is consistent with what the good shepherd requires and wants of us? Because the good shepherd has already spoken to us on many things. And that's how we get to know his voice because it's consistent with what he's already said, Right? And sometimes we do need to step out in faith, again, as long as it's consistent. But what if sometimes we aren't listening to what he's saying? We don't like what he's saying. Sometimes we look for confirmation for what we already want to do. And we're looking for confirmation for what we already believe. And we're like, all right, this is it. And we don't stop and ask ourselves, are we willing to follow the good shepherd wherever he may lead? And if we're not, then are we trusting that he's actually good, right? Because if we trust that he's actually good, then we're willing to have him lead us wherever he will. And so, are we blind to everything else except for what we want, or are we committed to him? You know, it's interesting, the blind man in chapter 9 of John, he trusted Jesus, imagine, like, he trusted Jesus to put mud on his eyes, and then trusted him to make it somehow to his, to, you know, to the pool of water, or the, the, you know, wherever he goes, washes himself, and then he beca- begins to be healed, or then he gets healed. And so, that is when his faith became sight, both physically and then spiritually after that. And so many of us are searching for this guidance, for purpose, for some, some sort of direction, right? But he is the good shepherd. Maybe this, this morning is a reminder. He's guiding you. He's, keep believing him. Keep seeking him. Even if it doesn't make sense right now, he wants what's good for you. Trust him with the rest, and he will guide you, and he will refresh your soul. So again, how is your soul today? Speaking of your soul, Christmas time could be very, um, very busy for most of us. Between family gatherings and friends events and cleaning and gifts and, you know, church events and all sorts of stuff going on at work, quarter four is coming to an end for some of us, and more gifts and shopping and all sorts of stuff happens, right? And amidst all the chaos, some of us are still, like, trying to get used to the fact that 2023 is almost over. Like, that's it, guys. There's, like, a few weeks left. I don't know. I don't know if I'm alone, but, like, it, it flew by. And a lot of us are still trying to figure that out, and we can't wait for things to get uh, to calm down and be normal. But for some of us, maybe you're here, maybe you're listening online, things will never be normal again. Maybe you've lost a loved one around the holidays, and it colors your holidays in a way that most people will never understand. Maybe there's a diagnosis, and you're honestly just wondering if you'll make it to next Christmas. Maybe there's broken relationships that you're trying to walk through, and you don't know what to do. For many of us, life hits us really hard. And the whole world feels like it doesn't stop. It keeps rejoicing, and there's carols, and there's hot cocoa and music, and you're in a dark valley of your own. May this morning be a reminder for you. We're going to be in Psalm 23 in a bit, not yet, but I want you to pay attention to verse 4. In the valley of the shadow of death, the shepherd is with you. Even in the presence of the very darkness that has overcome you, he has prepared a table in the presence of that darkness, in the presence of your enemies. And he's at the table with you. He has not left you. You are his. And he never will leave you. He cares deeply for your soul. Keep moving forward. Don't give up. Keep moving forward. Keep leaning in to the good shepherd and stay with his sheep. But for all of us, I want us to listen. uh, Please listen to this very carefully. Oftentimes, when it comes to this analogy of shepherd and sheep, a main point that people kind of see here is how dumb the sheep are and how, how prone they are to get themselves into trouble. And though that's true, th- that is true, the problem is that's not the main point of these texts. Like, the, the, main, the main draw of these texts in John 10, Psalm 23, and others is not, the emphasis is not how dumb the sheep are or how good the sheep are at following the shepherd. The emphasis is actually on how good the shepherd is. And so when it comes to your confidence in your walk with Jesus, your confidence has never been your obedience, although that's necessary. Your confidence has always been his goodness and his leadership and his guidance and his love and his mercy for you to restore your soul and what he's done for you. It's always been him. So as he leads and guides you, he protects you. He refreshes your soul. You are under his care. You're just a sheep. Breathe out. You know? He's good, and you have to trust that he's good. Psalm 23, David talks about what it's like to follow this shepherd. 
Could I ask that we all stand? I'm going to start concluding here. Ancient churches, um, they would read the Psalms out loud or sing the Psalms out loud together. And I'd like us to join in on this tradition this morning as, as we go through Psalm 23 together. But the thing is, while we read it together, I want all of us to read it from our own hearts. We've all came into this building with circumstances and things on our minds and this busy schedule and family members and all sorts of things. We're all going through something. We're all trying to look at the, at the voice. We're trying to hear the voice, see the face of our shepherd. And I would just ask that every one of us, as we read this together, both corporately and in our hearts, would we bring this psalm as a prayer of your heart to your good shepherd? And would you see your circumstance through this? And may the Spirit of God work a realignment in our hearts. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Would you illuminate the hearts and minds of your people in Jesus' name? Let's read. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I love how David describes the action of the shepherd as he refreshes my soul, or he restores my soul. How is your soul today? Does it long for a closeness with your good shepherd? If you're not following him, you're following something else. You know, the interesting thing about following the shepherd is None of us ever graduate from needing him. We always will. And that's because we were created for him. And identifying your shepherd's face is good. Sheep can do that. But what's even better is following him more intimately and more closely. And so I am not the shepherd of my life. He is. He knows what I need. If it was me, <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even be here. Looking over my walk with Christ, I think the last decade or so, like what stands out isn't how obedient or how good I was. What stands out is literally just Him. His goodness, His faithfulness, His mercy, His leading and guiding me every time I would wander off. And I would argue that for most of us in this room, if we look back over our walk with Jesus, it's exactly the same. He's always been good. He's always been faithful. And following Him has been quite a ride. It's been the best thing in the world. And I'm guessing for many of us would say the same thing. So as we go into a time of prayer and worship, I just want to get Psalm 23, verse 5 back on the screen. Maybe you're not in his sheepfold. Maybe you're not part of his sheep. You know, the psalm says that you anoint my head with oil. When, in all four Gospels, before Jesus' crucifixion, he was anointed with oil. It says, my cup overflows. You prepare, you, it tell, tells us you prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. On the night Jesus was betrayed, there was a table prepared before him. And if you read closely, the enemies, weren't, the enemies were both human and demonic. And the cup that he drank when he got betrayed wasn't the cup that David's talking about here. It was the cup that we all deserved. It was the cup that held our shame, our sin, our wandering, our brokenness, our sicknesses. He carried all of that and he drank it on our behalf to justify us before a holy and righteous God in a perfect standard. And why? It's because he loved us. He did this willingly. We see this in John 10 and in other places. It was out of the pure love of a triune God that he wanted us to be called his sheep and him our shepherd. You know, most of the time we read how sheep are, you know, sheep are killed for sacrifices or sheep are killed because someone wants to eat. And a lot of times sheep die because of things that their shepherds or their owners want. This is the only case where the shepherd willingly died for his sheep. Willingly. And you're invited to be one of them this morning if you aren't. But for the rest of us this morning or afternoon now, I, my prayer is that we would receive a freedom. A freedom when we realize that it's never really been that much about us. 
that we can trust the good shepherd to lead wherever he leads. And as long as we know that, as long as we trust that he's good and that he's got us and we submit our ways to him, everything else starts to fall into place. And so may some of us receive freedom this morning from this, from this weight of trying to be our own shepherd. Because the truth is, that thing that you're trying to let go of was never in your hand to begin with. It was always in his. His rod and his staff, they come for me and will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So if anything that I mentioned this morning falls into place with you, if you need a touch from the good shepherd, please make your way forward as we begin to worship and pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for everything that you're doing in our lives. Thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. Thank you that it was by your blood, our shepherd, that us sheep are washed clean. Thank you that it's not about us, that it's all about you. Thank you that you are good. Thank you that you are good, God. Thank you that you guide and lead us to green pastures, still waters. Thank you for the refreshment of the soul. And I pray for every individual in this room this morning that you would touch their soul, that you would renew their soul, that you would refresh them, that they would experience you anew, that they would experience how good you are, our good and righteous shepherd. Would you come into this room, God, and would you touch every heart, every life. For those who are struggling with something, would you guide them? Would you lead them? Would they understand what your rod and your staff are accomplishing in their life for your glory, for their good, for your good pleasure in their purpose. In Jesus' name, God, we thank you, Father, Son, and Spirit, for your triune love and everything you've done for us. Would you be with us? In Jesus' name, thank you.
thank you, Lord. Let's join hands with those that are standing next to us. Just begin to declare and pray this psalm over them that we are reading. Lord, we thank you so much for each person here. We thank you for making us a part of your family, for being our shepherd, Lord, for leading us. We thank you for your voice in our life. We thank you that, God, whenever we have wandered, you have faithfully brought us back to where we, God, want need to be. And we thank you that every need we have is met in you. Every want we have is met in you. We thank you that you truly bring peace to our soul, comfort to us, rest to us. We thank you that you, God, know the way that we go. We thank you so much. We bless one another. We bless our families, our homes, our businesses, our children. And we thank you, Lord, that you, you are our protector. You are our hiding place. You are the one that leads us, leads our families, and leads us, Lord, as a church. And we bless, we bless each other in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. Today, God, we are reminded to again and again put our trust in you, put our confidence in you, that you know what's best, that you know, God, where we ought to go. We thank you so much for your faithfulness in our life. We thank you that you are the shepherd, God, above us who laid down his life for us. And we thank you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you for laying down your life to give us life. We thank you so much for giving us peace and hope. We thank you for all that you've done, God. Continue to do. We lift up your holy name. We lift up your holy name in this place. Come on, let's give our shepherd the praise and honor he is worthy of. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Were you blessed by that word? Amen. Yes, we were. We were. I'm uh, actually, during Alex's preaching, I was like, man, I'm so surprised that he didn't come talk to me being a shepherd uh, to get some pointers and, and some advice to his message. But maybe next time if he continues part two. I'm just kidding. Before we leave, as I have your attention, we want to... Uh, do a here we go, are you ready for this? a special offering uh, and the reason for this offering is uh, about a week ago uh, my uncle David, who our teams go to in Honduras he reached out to us called pastor, he called me um, and who, whoever has been there he has a huge property that now by the grace of God is all paid off and that's where the orphanage is, and now a huge kitchen hall and missionary uh, rooms where missionaries can stay and people who visit him can stay out. That building is being finished right now, and that's where our teams go. But uh, he has been, uh, for now, a, for a couple of years now, working with uh, a government official to get funding to build a rehab center. Uh, many of the people that work there at the, at our, at our, at the base uh, are maybe ex-drug addicts, ex-people ex -people who are in the mafia. And he has actually had a lot of people that work there and then end up getting dragged back into their addictions who died, who died right there on the street, maybe drunk, get, got hit by a car. And so he's, he's, had a, he's had it in his heart for many, many years to have a rehab center. And he began to work with an official who now uh, just finally signed, just a week ago, uh, full funding to build a rehab center. It's a miracle. Um, and when I say full funding, I'm not talking about just a brick and mortar building where they can now have a center. I'm talking about everything that will cost the, uh, to making a, a wonderful center. They're going to have uh, a, a huge gymnasium there. They're going to have a huge building there for men and women. Uh, the road that to the property, they're going to be putting lights and paving everything, a gate. Uh, like every detail that he needs, but David must be the one providing a property. The government can't give him a property, but they can give him funding to build everything that this rehab center will need. He has found a property that uh, he can buy. It's around, it's about 50 to 60,000. Why 50 to 60? Because he can choose how big he wants to buy the property because the woman he is buying from has a lot of property 
and he's wanting to buy four or five acres. Every acre is about $12,000, so if he buys five, it's going to be about $60,000. If he buys four, it's going to be about $48,000. So um, he's asked if we could participate in, in, in gathering funds and send whatever we gather. And so um, if I can have our ushering team come forward, I just want us to pray, pray for this. And if your heart is open to give, I know this is kind of out of nowhere. We were wanting to announce the last Sunday, so it's not so uh, in your face. But if your heart is open to give something towards this, for us to be able to buy a property and then begin to build this rehab center on. Um, if you don't have something to give today, if you are just wanting to keep thinking about this and you're like, God, I want to I want to give, then you're going to be able to get, you can give any time this week. The next week's we're going to wait for money to come in. As it comes in, we're going to send it there to Honduras to David. So let's pray. God, we just thank you so much for what you're doing, God, what you're doing not only here and other areas that we go to, but what you're doing in Honduras and what you've got are leading our team into next. And we just thank you so much. We thank you for this rehab center being built there in Honduras to be able to minister to many, many people who have need there. And we just pray, God, we pray for this property to be purchased, for that building to begin. And we just thank you, God, so much. We thank you that, God, you, you, God, see this need. You, God, know. You've put it, God, in, in David's heart. You've put it in the team's heart, God, for this to come to pass. And we thank you for you lining everything up to this moment, God. And we just pray that every, every single dollar that is in, that we need, that it would come in in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you so much for you touching people's hearts, that no one here, no one here has to continue to give to Honduras or has to give uh, a huge dollar amount. But God, whatever you, whatever you put on any person's heart here, those that are watching us online, we just thank you. We thank you for each person's obedience to you, to what you've got to challenge them, uh, telling them to do. And we just thank you so much for these funds being raised in a miraculous way. We thank you for your blessing upon each person's life that is going to be sowing and giving. And we thank you for what you're doing there in Honduras. And we thank you for the people, God, that we're going to be seeing, that we're going to see reach through this in Jesus' mighty name. We're so grateful and honored, God, to be a part of this work and what you're doing, God, in these last days. And we bless. We bless David. We bless Veronica, his wife. We bless their team there. Everything they're doing, God, day in and day out, we bless them in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you. And everybody said,